Weatherproof Your Business is actually about arming your business with the skills and getting in front of the decisions that you need to make to weather any storm, to handle any change and any risk that the world can throw at you. And the way we want to do that is to keep it really simple. So the Weatherproof Your Business program is different from a lot of other risk management programs. It doesn't delve deep, deep, deep into every one of the personal issues that your business might face, but it provides you with that first point of call, essentially first aid for your business when a crisis hits. Now a crisis, as Bev introduced, is not just something that physically affects your business. A crisis is any event which has the potential to harm the perceptions of your business or the actual business. We work with businesses right throughout the flood and cyclone seasons in Queensland over the last five years and we found that many businesses were not physically affected and yet their businesses have struggled to get the turnover and the cash back in the bank that they need because of the, the, value, the value and challenges of perception. So we want to talk about all of those issues today how to physically get your business back up and running again, and how to a challenge and tackle those perceptions. If your business hasn't been through a major risk or crisis in the last four or five years, um, then I wouldn't like to say to expect one, but all businesses go through them. So what we want you to do is to be prepared for that event to occur. I won't harbour on, uh, on the wettest year on record that we had last year, but with, um, with five months of high rainfall, um, Queensland was not seen as open for business. We had reached a point at which many of our customers were grappling with the idea of would they take a Queensland holiday only to be consumed by one of the largest cyclones on record to hit a populated area, Cyclone Yasi. Physically, we weathered the storm very well because we have great building codes, we have great partners in insurance and we have great agencies who want to step into the breach and fill that space with really good information. But the challenge is real. Some of the challenges are not so big. Some of them could be as small as a potential handbag swimming in your swimming pool. Um, there are all sorts of challenges and risks that face your business. How you respond to them and how you deal with your customers there on the day and with the media if you get an opportunity to do so is what today is all about. Putting your best foot forward in a crisis situation. Now for those of you who have their computers, the business continuity template you'll see is not a very long document. We hope that it's going to become your bible of templates. For those of you that are working in hard copy, this is the form that we're going to be using today. So if you wouldn't mind um, putting your name and the business name on the front and popping your signature on the front, that is for me your commitment to do two things. One, to see this program all the way through. Today, in the four hours we have together, we'll cover off on an enormous amount of things but there will be things you'll need to do back in your own business. So I ask you to one, commit to completing the templates when you get back to your business, and that should only take you a few hours at most. But secondly, and as Lynn said importantly, you need to take from today the skill, willingness and ability to teach others the things that you learn here today. We did some work for the uh, Asia Pacific Economic Forum in, uh, in 2008, and we found that 80% of businesses who faced a major crisis or event, something really significant, simply did not last two years. Any guess on what the major contributing factor to not surviving two years? Beth, what do you think might have been the major contributing factor to businesses not making it two years after a crisis? Faith in the business, yeah, yeah. perceptions of the business. Alan, what do you think? What are some of the things that might contribute to a business not being able to get back up to speed? Cash flow. Cash flow. Yeah. So there's a couple of really important points in there. Perception, cash flow, and ability to get back to business as quickly as possible. The faster you can get back to business, not only do you start putting money back in the bank account again, but you tackle the other two issues, cash flow, and you start to challenge the perceptions. We're back up and going, we're confident, and we know that we're moving forward. And that's exactly what it comes down to. We call it a roadmap to recovery. This is the resources that your business expends during a crisis, and this is the amount of time. Unsurprisingly, if the resources you invest and the time extends with that maximum amount of resources, you'll drain your cash flows very quickly. Very few businesses have an enormous amount of cash sitting in the bank waiting for a moment like this. So today I want you to start working through the scenarios of what if one of these significant uh, effects came uh, upon my business, whether it be weather related uh, or insurance related. And I'm glad that we have Jason here. We can talk a bit about some of those effects because a lot of that is perception as well as reality. Um, 
if those things happen, today is about doing the thinking before and not on the day. We want to reduce that stress and the time that it takes for you to respond to the event, to know just what you want to do and start that process immediately. As I said, the fundamental factor is if we can shorten the time it takes for your business to start earning again and getting back on track, then your likelihood of succeeding um, and surviving the crisis is exponentially higher. It's not a matter of if but when. So let's prepare ourselves for when. And what I want you to start doing now as I'm um, introducing you to how we're going to run today um, and you're multitasking as all good business people do, I want you to start thinking about the most significant event in terms of the time it might take you to recover and the resources that you may need to recover that your business could likely face. And we do that on two really simple things, how likely it is and how significant it is. So start thinking through now the sort of events that might affect your business. And I'll show you a little template we can use to work through that. A little story to start the game off. Miramar Cruises um, runs a little boat up to Lone Pine, has done for 30 plus years and is an icon of uh, tourism in Brisbane. It's a small business, 10 people, and it relies on a very seasonal flow of visitors through summer and, uh, and the school holidays, and it runs on a very limited cash flow. Debbie Garbett, the marketing manager, came along to a session just like this one, in fact about the same number of people, and asked herself the question, I think I have a good idea on if I lose my boat, how long it would take me to get a new boat and how much it would cost me to get over that uh, hurdle. But one of the other fundamental things I need in a marine business is to be able to get my passengers onto the boat. And she'd never really thought about that. And I want you today to start thinking about some of those likely and significant impacts on your business. Now, I'm not Nostradamus. I didn't predict that on the 11th of January, the um, the pontoon by which they tie up to would be completely swept away by the largest floods Brisbane has seen since 1974, but that's what happened. Now through the process, Debbie was able to identify just a couple of simple steps that she and her business partners could go through just to firm up their business if that was to be the reality, and you know what it was. What did they do? They identified another berth that they could use. They spoke to MSQ, the Maritime Safety Queensland, to identify what barriers there might be to tying up at another berth. And they made contact with the other berth operator to say, what would you need from us in terms of lead time? Do I have the right depth? Can I get a turning circle? Where are my customers going to go? Really, it was a few half hour conversations. Thankfully, that happened in November. MSQ actually had a workshop about it in December because they were unsure what the situation would be and they went through their own crisis management response exercise and what they found was, yes, that could be done. So on the 11th of January, Debbie started making her phone, first phone calls to the two people she'd already reached out to, the guy in MSQ and the lady from the, the wharf in the Breakfast Creek. Both of them said, look, we're happy to work with you. We understand your situation. That simple couple of half hour phone calls reduced the amount of time from about 10 weeks they thought it would take to getting back into operation in six weeks. Actually in four weeks they took their first booking to take people back onto the river once all of the safety requirements of MSQ were met. And that simple exercise of shortening the amount of time meant that they didn't lose one of their major clients, a young lady who had two years in advance booked to have her wedding on the boat. Now, that simple fact made a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. And from Miramar Cruises' perspective, it's one of the few things they put down to their business still being here today. Just that little bit of preparation. You know, um, my grandmother said it and yours probably did too, a stitch in time saves nine. And that stitch in time is what we're here for today. So start thinking today about the things that could unhook your business from your cash flow and from those positive perceptions your business needs and let's start working out the solutions to get you back into business as quickly as possible. Possibly the most difficult part of a session like this is we all externalise the risks. Everything is outside of our business and almost never do we think about the impact on ourselves personally. Uh, two guys who run a surfing clinic down on the Gold Coast talking about the major risk to them is one of their customers in a shark attack. I said, well, in terms of likelihood, the person who's on the board every day is actually your brother. So one of the most likely people to be affected is your brother. How does your crisis response program, what does your plan do if it's him that's affected? And the whole thing goes out the window for obvious reasons. Whole family, 
the whole team of people who would have been helping them in a crisis situation were all family members. So every one of them would have been dedicated and by the side of that person who was injured. And they, quite obviously, would throw the business uh, needs second. So in that situation, we call it Murphy's Law, and I always put it right at the top in terms of resources and time. It's one of the hardest things to overcome. The, the last thing you want to happen at the time happens. The one person you don't want in a crisis to be out of action is the one person who is in, uh, in old Murphy's Law. The, the critical need is for every business to get back up and going, for your business to maximise its potential, and you need to be able to help other businesses to get back on their feet so that we as a destination can build the perception and deliver that service. Now the great thing about this program, while it's called Weatherproof Your Business, um, it takes an all hazards approach, just like all approaches to emergency management and risk management uh, anywhere in the world. So while you might develop specific detailed plans around a particularly significant and likely risk, at the first instance you have to take an all hazards approach. And that's what we do today. So we're going to walk through that and that's what the business continuity template is for. So my grandmother said a stitch in time saves nine. The research says a dollar invested in mitigation saves a dollar in, uh, in operational cost. So you are investing in your business right now. Every minute that you spend here thinking about how to make get back to cash flow, get back to business as usual, um, then you're making an investment in your business. So there are four stages of uh, crisis management. Prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. What I usually say is most businesses are fantastic at getting out of their business. We all know how to evacuate. That's the one thing that is required by law and we're required to know how to get everybody out of the crisis situation. Today is also about how you get back in. So we want to talk as much about how we get you in as how we get everybody safely out. No doubt that's got to happen, but for your business to survive, I've got to get you back into it and start um, putting revenue back into the business. So, thinking then about the event. So I want you now to start to hone down your thinking on the most significant and the most likely event that could affect your business, and we're going to choose that to, write, to guide us through today's session. That could be anything. Now, Cyclone Larry, um, was a very significant event. It has broad reaching effects. So we often use those, what we call crisis situations. So this is an incident or an event and this is where we come into something like a crisis that has long term impacts on the business. It doesn't go away overnight and it has potential to have a significant drain on your resources, both in responding to it and in reduced cash flow over time. If we can find something that has that significance and impact over time, then you'll get the most out of this exercise. If you use something simple, um, like uh, loss of IT services for an hour or two, then you won't be able to explore the depth and range of the issues that your business might face. So think about something that's going to have some long-term impact. And this is where we start to use your business continuity template. So inside the front cover is this little checklist here. And this is my response to Murphy's Law. Um, we often think about responding to a crisis in a situation where everyone we want to be there is there, just the person who should be in charge is in charge, and just the process we want to happen is going to happen. Murphy's Law will say the person in charge, as Alan has explained, will be a volunteer who will be representing your business at the time, who may have only been there for a few weeks, and they could be the front line of your next crisis. So these little forms are designed for the front line so that everybody knows exactly what is expected of them. So what I want you to do is just flick past that into page five and we call them triggers and implications and I want you to identify the most significant and most likely impact on your business. As I said in many cases your staff will have only a few seconds to assess the crisis and they'll need to respond based on the information you've given them. So this little template, incident, emergency, crisis and disaster. Um, provides a way to filter out things that can be responded to straightforward in a very straightforward way as opposed to those that are going to take a little bit more time, effort and energy. So what I want you to do on that page five, or for those of you that are using your computers um, on the triggers and implications, is to write down in the implication the most significant and likely event in each category. So what's the most significant and likely incident that could occur to your business, like something like a loss of power. How likely is that? How significant would that be? Which one of those is it? So write down examples 
of each of those sort of crises. And we use this little exercise here to give you some prompts and ideas so that you can use the ideas that other people have put forward. Identify at least one in every category, a significant but likely incident, event, crisis and disaster. For the one you've identified as a crisis, that one which impacts and has the potential to impact on human life, on the viability of your business, on other businesses and relies on um, other parts of the region um, to be involved, that's the one I want you to think a bit more about today and that's the one we want to use as our example right the way through today. Karis, if that's a, a weather event, extended wet period leading up to the event day, what does that mean for you? Is it cancellation, is it refund or is there some alternative? Is there a way for us to continue the business on? Alan, if for example on your site it was uh, a significant injury um, to a volunteer or to a customer, um, what does that mean for the business? Is it a full shutdown? How quickly could you get back to business? So start thinking through the implications of that crisis on your business. Um, and Bev, you'll need to choose which one of the businesses you want to model this out for. But the all hazards approach works in an all business approach as well. So um, the, the same approach can be applied to both. Um, a quick question around the room. Is there anyone in the room whose phone bill goes to somebody not on site? That the phone number associated with your telephone bill is with a head office in Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne or outside of your location. So Alan, in your situation, does the phone bill come to you? I know this is a strange question. It'll make sense in just a moment. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the ideal system for emergency management is what they call a polygon system where every phone and um, mobile phone that is within a radius of an affected area would be sent an emergency message prior to an event. But at the moment, the polygon system has not been implemented. It's been trialled and there are some challenges with it and it'll take some time to roll out. So what happens at the moment is the telephone number associated with the person on your bill is the person who receives your early warning. So for something like a tsunami or earthquake situation, um, change of location of a cyclone or flooding, those warnings will be sent. Um, they'll either be um, uh, watches or warnings and they'll be sent to the phone number associated with your bill. So for every one of you in the room, you need to identify who that is. Because the time could be the big difference between how long it takes your business to be ready to move the boat into the right location or not. So knowing who that is and informing them that they are at the top of your crisis management team for something where you would receive an early warning in a natural disaster. So write down on your page, um, on the following page, we call it the contact hierarchy, Write down the name of the person who is the person who's going to receive that early warning message. So just call them early warning and put down their name and phone number. You'll need to contact them today, if they're not you, to advise them that, uh, that this is a situation. Um, as we said, when you're in a situation, as Brian has explained, if you've registered for the alert, you've checked your flood mapping, then it's a matter of asking your team to understand what the impacts of your, on your business will be how big that will be, what the severity of it will be, who's likely to be affected, and to start to make some decisions. So this is what we pull together as what we call a crisis team. Now, that's a crisis term. Um, these are people you know you can trust in a crisis situation. Most people think about employees. They work through the organisational chart. Remember that in a real crisis situation when your business future is at risk, you may not call just employees. You will reach out to whoever will help your business get back on its feet. And for every person you identify, there must be an alternative. There must be a fallback because Murphy's Law will say that the person you want will be unavailable just when you need them most. So today we'll make sure we identify about five people who could help you, who would be your crisis team. And that's going into that same location, that little contact hierarchy. So as we're talking through that, start to identify those people now, whether they're in your business or people that you know you would call on in a crisis situation. There's a lot of jobs that need to be done in a crisis. You need to update your website, you need to inform your insurer, you may need to work with your lawyer. You'll need to have a look at your communication both to staff and suppliers. You'll need to bring your accountant in. All of these things can be done by one person. But in your crisis situation where there's potentially media pressure, 
external pressure, internal pressure for information, that's the sort of situation that leads itself to a delay and that delay could be the thing that, under, that uh, undermines the viability of your business. So we want to make sure that we've identified who's going to help, what roles they're going to play in your crisis situation, who you can call on in a, in a crisis situation, who you know you can trust. So start working through that in your own mind, who those people will be.